we are now going to look at multicycle peripherals and the idea of buses. The basic idea of peripherals has already been seen in the previous video 9.1. In this case, we are going to look at how we can extend the idea of a peripheral to something which can operate on a multiple cycle CPU and more importantly, how this can in turn be used in order to interface with peripherals that themselves require multiple clock cycles in order to respond. So to recall our earlier discussion of multi-cycle CPUs, the example of the load instruction would be that we implement a finite state machine that would perhaps have states like this. The first state, load S1, would read the instruction and get the register values in S2 we would compute the ALU output, which would be the address from which we are trying to read and apply this to the DMEM, the data memory. In the same state, we would also compute the new value of the program counter, which would basically be always PC plus four because we do not have any branches and apply it to the instruction memory. In state S3, we get the IMEM output since we are assuming that this is a synchronous read and it takes a single clock cycle to respond and send that data to the instruction register. Similarly, we also get the DMEM output and store it in a register. Now, we could change this quite easily by replacing the word DMEM with the word bus. All that we care about is that something outside the CPU is willing to accept this address that we are sending out and will correspondingly give us back data. We do not really care whether that something is a memory block or some kind of a structure that performs some logic or computation and returns a value as long as it always gives it back to us by the time we reach state S3. Now what happens if the bus or the peripheral to which it is connected actually requires more time? That is, it cannot always guarantee that it will give us back the data within a single clock cycle. Well, that's also easy to solve. Just introduce a wait state. In this case, what we do is after applying the ALU output to the bus, we move into state S wait rather than state S3. Now we could also have an extra condition in state S2 that checks whether we need to wait. And if we do not need to wait, we could transition straight away to S3. But in general, we would move into the wait state. What happens in the wait state? As the name indicates, we wait for a response, which means that we clearly need some signal to come back from the bus. So all that the bus needs to do now is to indicate by perhaps making some signal high that it is now ready to give the data back to the CPU. Once this response signal has come from the bus, we can compute the program counter to be the updated program counter and apply it to IMM so that on the next clock cycle, the instruction is ready. And we also know that since the response has come from the bus, on the next clock cycle, we can get the bus output and store that into the register. Now, this could be used to handle either the case of a slow memory, something that requires multiple clock cycles to respond, or a general peripheral that needs more than one clock cycle in order to compute its output and return it to the CPU. This means that a multi-cycle peripheral can be implemented just by modifying the state machine inside the multi-cycle CPU. The CPU can wait as long as required and we use handshaking signals. In particular, the response signal coming from the bus is used in order to control the update or to tell the CPU when it can move forward. The main problem, as you might notice over here, is that the CPU has to wait. In other words, every time we perform a load instruction, we of course have to wait until the data comes back. Now what we are saying is, since we are waiting for a handshaking signal to come back from an external peripheral, we do not know whether the peripheral is guaranteed to give us back a response within a certain amount of time. Even if it is guaranteed, that time could be fairly large. It could be tens of cycles, or if we are dealing with a really slow peripheral, perhaps something which is human interaction device, it could be hundreds or thousands of clock cycles. Does the CPU get a chance to do anything else during this time? No because we have literally introduced this right into the state machine as part of the instruction. And the CPU is not allowed to even load the next instruction until it has got a valid response from the bus. This could of course be a problem. We will deal with it later. For now, 
let's just consider what happens when we are able to deal with multi-cycle peripherals. Given that there are typically many different multi-cycle peripherals that we want to deal with, this brings up the notion of something called a bus. A bus in general is can be thought of as just a collection of wires. The address, the data bus, and the read-write enable control signals, a few of those. However, as we have already seen, once we bring the arbiter into the picture, it means that the arbiter now takes care of interfacing multiple different peripherals. In order to standardize how this is to be done, many different buses have been proposed in the processor architecture area. One of the most popular these days is something called the AXI bus, which is essentially something called the advanced extensible interface and is an evolution of the advanced microcontroller bus architecture that was proposed by ARM. ARM is one of the most popular ISAs or the most popular CPU architectures in existence today. As a result, the AXI bus, especially because it was made into an open standard, has gained wide popularity and is used in a number of different systems, not just in ARM processors anymore. It defines various handshaking protocols on how communication can happen between a CPU. Of course, in the case of AXI, it is defined with respect to an ARM processor, but in general, ARM could be replaced by any CPU. And the handshaking protocols essentially define how the communication should take place between the CPU and the bus, and in turn between the bus and various peripherals that could be attached to it. We are going to very briefly look at a broad picture of what the bus architecture looks like and how it could be used in order to connect different peripherals. This is a schematic picture of what a typical system on chip could look like, one that consists of an ARM processor with various different peripherals. The key ingredient, of course, over here is the high-performance ARM processor. But as you can see, this is just one small portion of the entire system on chip. We have memory, which is interfaced through a high bandwidth memory interface. We have the various user interface devices and other kinds of peripherals like timers, programmable input output, and so on. There is also some high bandwidth on chip memory and this last module called the DMA bus master which we are going to ignore for now, but primarily whose job is to allow copying data between the different peripherals while allowing the CPU to continue doing its own work and not getting stuck with just copying data between peripherals. So as you can see, in the context of an overall system on chip, the CPU actually ends up being a relatively small part of the overall system. What we do have is this thick line the thick black line that you can see over here marked AHB is something called the high performance bus, the AMBA high performance bus. And if you notice, you will realize that all the devices connected there are high bandwidth. There is a high bandwidth on chip RAM, a high bandwidth memory interface, the CPU itself, which is a high performance processor. And of course the DMA bus master, whose job, as I said, is to copy data around between blocks of, of memory. Now high bandwidth and high performance, of course, are relative terms. But the important point over here is that they are definitely much higher bandwidth and performance than the peripherals on the other side of this bridge. And the bridge is essentially used in order to connect peripherals that are much slower, things like UART and keypad with the processor. The reason we require such a bridge is because otherwise we could easily end up blocking the processor and the slow peripherals could end up eating up all the time of the processor and not really allowing it to do anything useful. Let's look at what a simple bus transfer would look like using the AXI protocol. As you can see over here, there is a clock signal, an address, some control, which would primarily be the read or write signals. And there is the HW data in case we are trying to write data to a peripheral and an HR data in case we are trying to read data. There is also an H ready signal, which essentially takes care of the handshaking. It tells us when the HR data, that is the read response data, is 
valid and when we can basically capture the data. As you can see over here, the bus transfer consists of two phases, the address phase and the data phase, which means that we give the address in the first clock cycle and it is read or captured at the clock edge along with the control signals. The read response, on the other hand, comes back at the end of the next clock cycle. Or similarly, if we were trying to write data, we would need to provide it in the next clock cycle so that the peripheral can accept the data and then decide what to do with it. You'll notice that there is also an edge ready, which indicates over here that the read has completed. That is to say, you can accept the data which is coming in now. This is why we say that the read data can actually be taken at this clock edge corresponding to the edge ready. What happens when we have multiple devices that need to connect to this bus? We take the addresses and the data signals corresponding to each of them and put them through various address and control multiplexers and write data multiplexers as well as read data multiplexers. And the arbiter that you see up here essentially creates control or select signals for each of these multiplexers that allows us to control which of the masters is allowed to write data to any given slave or to request data back from any given slave. And the decoder in turn takes care of the return problem. That is which of the slaves response is going to be sent back to the master. You will notice that the output from the read data mux is connected to all the masters. Whichever one requested the data is the one that is going to accept it. What the inputs of the read data mux does is basically takes data from each of the slaves and based on the decoder value, decoder select signal, it will decide which data actually comes through to the output. Similarly, the address and control mux will allow us to decide which of the three masters in this diagram is allowed to actually communicate with the slave, similarly with the write data max. The bus decoder can in turn be used in order to activate or selectively activate or deactivate each of the slaves. So in other words, the arbiter and this bus decoder together allow us to do all the work that was required in order to attach multiple peripherals to this bus and allow, in this case, multiple masters if necessary to communicate with each of those peripherals. The interesting thing to note throughout this is that all the selection process of who gets to talk to whom at any given point is ultimately implemented just using multiplexers. In terms of hardware, the actual realization of these multiplexers may or may not be done using combinations of AND gates and so on. We could also use other kinds of direct circuit level implementations, in particular different kinds of tri-stating logic. But at least at the logical level, in order to understand what exactly is happening, they are ultimately performing selections, which are best described using multiplexers. Which is why you will notice that all the diagrams basically indicate the operation by use of multiplexers, but the actual realization at the circuit level may be done using different techniques for performance optimization reasons. Now, what this ready signal allows us to do is that we could also go further and introduce wait states. As you can see over here, the ready signal is low in the first two clock cycles after the address phase, but finally becomes high only in the third clock cycle after the address phase. And what that means is that this essentially, the read request which was started in the address phase will complete only by the third clock cycle as indicated in this diagram. So you can see that the multi-cycle implementation is easily implemented just by this one signal, the H ready signal, which is introduced into the bus. What about multiple transfers? This is where the performance of the bus starts to come in. Essentially what it says is, even though the data coming back from the bus might take several clock cycles, there's nothing preventing us from starting the next operation 
before the first one has completed. This is essentially a form of pipelining. Just as in the case of a CPU, you can also have pipelining inside the bus transfers themselves. So for example, what you can see is this first request to A gets back its data in the next clock cycle. B on the other hand undergoes a single cycle wait because the H ready signal goes low, which means that it completes after two clock cycles. But that does not prevent us from starting C. All that it means is that C now gets stretched out over two clock cycles and in turn completes at the next clock cycle after B has completed. What we are going to do now is to look at a few schematic diagrams of how various kinds of peripherals are attached to the microblaze soft processor core from Xilinx. Now, what exactly is microblaze? As I said, it's a soft IP or intellectual property core, which is provided by Xilinx. And the reason it's called a soft processor is because there is no hardware actually present on the FPGA corresponding to the processor. It is given as Verilog code or some kind of RTL code, which can directly be instantiated into the logic of the FPGA and ends up creating a processor. The RISC-V processor could also be synthesized and run as a soft IP core on the FPGA if necessary. Microblaze is something that is provided directly from Xilinx. In this case, it has its own instruction set. It is not a RISC-V compatible instruction set. It's a completely different instruction set. But the advantage here is that Xilinx provides a lot of extra development tools around it, which allows easily constructing large systems using the Microblaze processor. A big advantage of the Microblaze is that it now uses the AXI bus. Earlier, it used to use a different form of bus, but nowadays, given the popularity of ARM, they also switched over to the AXI bus, which is great because it means that a number of different peripherals designed by different people are now available as standard IPs that can be interfaced with the Microblaze processor. This means that we can also connect to peripherals that have been designed for other CPUs without having to redesign either the peripheral or the processor core. This is an example of what a microblaze would look like with a very simple single peripheral attached to it. You can see that there are many blocks in this diagram. Most of them are unimportant. For example, the block on the left is essentially just a clock wizard. It takes care of providing clocking signals to the CPU. The microblaze debug module, as well as the reset and clock wizard, all of them can be safely ignored since they have no particular say in the behavior of the rest of the logic. The microblaze processor itself, as you can see, has relatively few inputs and outputs. It has a clock and a reset. It has one port marked as interrupt and another marked as debug. And it also has two sets of wires on the right hand side which connect to a local memory. But the most important wire in some ways is the AXI data port which connects to the microblaze AXI peripheral, the block that is seen to the right of the microblaze and a little above it. As you can see here, this block essentially is some kind of an interconnect. Its job is primarily to make sure that the microblaze can be interfaced with various different peripherals. In this case, there is only a single peripheral, a timer. Now, what happens in this case? If you recall, what exactly is done with peripherals is that we need to have the arbiter logic, which in this case is basically the interconnect. And the peripheral itself also needs to have some kind of memory map assigned to it. This is an example of what the address map looks like for the case of the microblaze plus a simple timer. If you look carefully at it, you will realize that the data, overall data bus width is 32 bits, which corresponds to four gig locations. This is exactly what we already know about a 32 bit CPU. But what it says is that the local memory, the microblaze zero local memory 
is just 8 kilobytes in size. The offset address is all zeros up to location 1FFF. 1FFF is essentially 13 ones, which basically means it corresponds to 2 to the power of 13 minus 1 or 8K, 2 to the power of 13. So 8K addresses or byte locations are assigned to the local memory bus this being the local memory bus as seen over here. The AXI timer itself is a separate peripheral. The timer peripheral has very simple functionality. Pretty much all that it does is whenever you read from it, it will probably give you back a simple the uh, count of number of clock cycles that have elapsed since the system was switched on. But it also has a little extra functionality. For example, you can program it to generate some kind of a signal after some amount of time has elapsed, after some number of clock cycles have elapsed. So it can be used kind of like a countdown timer. Now you'll notice that this has an offset address of 41C00000. Why was this particular address chosen? There's no fundamental reason for that. This is just a choice which is sort of semi-random but is made by the Xilinx system software itself. All that is really required over here is that the arbiter knows that the AXI timer is at this address. And correspondingly, whatever software that we write also needs to know this address so that it knows how to communicate with the timer. In other words, we need to know that if we want to talk to the timer, we need to store at this particular address or load from this particular address. Now, you will notice that it has a range of 64K locations. That is, rather than just having one single address corresponding to a timer, it actually has 64,000, or to be more precise, 65,536 addresses associated with this simple timer. The functionality of the timer is not all that much. We can't really need that many addresses for the timer. So why assign such a large address range to a timer? And most often the reason is simply, well, why not? And to explain that a little further, what I mean over here is, if you do not actually have four gigabytes of memory on your system, and you have allocated some part of the memory of the system just for peripherals, you do not really gain anything by leaving some of those addresses free. So there is nothing lost, for example, by allocating 64K locations to this AXI timer. If you wanted to reduce it to even something like, you know, just a total of eight memory locations, you're perfectly free to do so by changing the range and changing the high address. What usually ends up happening though, is that most of these peripherals, because of ease of use and convenience of use, they prefer that most of the memory locations are aligned to some kind of multiple of probably 1K or some other number of bytes. Therefore, if you try reducing the number of locations to less than 1K, you might actually find that the system doesn't allow you to do it. But apart from that, there's really nothing to enforce that you need to use 64k over here. The timer does not require that many addresses, but in this case it's, why not? There's nothing preventing us from using that many, so we might as well just allocate that many addresses there. What happens if we add one more slave? In this case, as you can see, we have the timer out here, but now I have also added something else, which is a UART. A UART is also an output device. The UART in this case is basically a serial port. What it can do is if you write to the serial port, it will take that output and display it on some kind of a screen or maybe send it out to a printer. On the other hand, if you try to read from the UART port, you will get back data which could come from either a keyboard or a similar kind of device or possibly from some kind of a console device, an input output device. Now, you'll notice that even though the UART is capable of providing data to the CPU, it is still considered a slave device. It responds only when the CPU activates it. The important thing to notice over here is now the interconnect has increased 
we now have two ports and the arbiter now needs to essentially take care that whenever the cpu is trying to talk to one of the peripherals which of those peripherals is going to be activated will be decided by the address map stored inside the arbiter let's take a look at that address map in this case what we find is as before the timer essentially has is retained at the same address that we had earlier but now you'll notice that there is also a uart light at some other address 4060 where did this come from once again it is just a choice made by the software tools provided by xilinx range of addresses as explained earlier 64k because why not you have enough memory locations free anyway now this is a more interesting example because it's a more complex peripheral apart from the uart and the timer that we had earlier we now have a third peripheral in this case it's a tft controller a tft controller is essentially something that is a touch screen plus display and you will notice in particular that something is different over here it is to the left of the arbiter and in particular it also has one connection that leads in to one of the slave connections of the arbiter the other slave connection of the arbiter comes from the cpu itself so what this effectively tells us is that this device is also a bus master in other words the tft controller by itself is capable of initiating transactions on the bus what does it mean to initiate transactions on the bus it means that it can perform a read or a write request by itself without involving the cpu why would this be useful or necessary the reason is because the tft controller needs to display something on a touch screen which means that it needs to access the entire display memory which could typically be pretty large several megabytes in size possibly if you have a large enough display to be shown for example a 1000 cross 1000 image is already 1 mega locations 1 megapixel and if each pixel corresponds to let's say 32 bits of data that's essentially 4 megabytes of data that you need to be able to access if the cpu now needs to update this large amount of data 30 or 60 times per second that means that the cpu is pretty much going to be doing nothing much other than updating the information in the tft controller's memory because of this high bandwidth peripherals like the tft controller usually have some way by which they can directly access the memory and transfer the data which is required directly from the memory into the tft controller while the cpu continues to do other work now of course doing other work might involve reading from memory which means that now we have a chance of contention which one should it be the cpu or the tft controller which gets to read or write from the memory at any given point in time that decision of course is handled by the arbiter when you have multiple masters the arbiter decides at any given clock cycle who has control of the bus for how long and what they can do with it the address map in this case the upper part of it corresponds of course to the microblaze itself as you can see nothing much has changed except that the tft has also been added it also has been given a 64k range right so this 64k range essentially corresponds to the addresses that are available for the cpu to talk to the tft in other words if i want to configure the tft if i want to tell it that this is the place where you can go and find the image to be displayed on the screen now go and transfer the data on your own and display it on the screen those are the kinds of instructions that a cpu would typically give to the tft controller those control signals are given by writing to this offset address and somewhere within this range of addresses corresponding to the tft but you'll notice that the tft itself is also a bus master and effectively what we have is over here we have the video data the same 32 bit address range but it clearly states that this set of addresses 
which are already mapped inside the CPU are excluded address segments. In other words, there are already peripherals available at these addresses. Do not try and access them. The other thing that you would notice in this case is that the data memory that was available for the CPU is not directly accessible by the TFT controller in this case. If you want it to be able to access it, you have to make it available in some other way through the bus. But in general, if you look at the structure of the microblaze, the data memory actually does not go through the AXI controller at all, the local memory. This is one part of control which is done directly by the microblaze and the AXI peripheral controller or the interconnect is essentially told to stay out of this block of memory. We can extend this further and now have two microblazes in the picture. Right? So as you can see over here, things are getting more and more complicated. The arbiter that we have over here now has three slave ports. One from the TFT controller, one from one microblaze and one from the other microblaze. It also has three master ports. Keep in mind over here that a master port on the arbiter is essentially used in order to talk to one of the slave devices. In this case, what are the slaves that we have? The timer, the UART, and one port of the TFT itself. In other words, you can see that the TFT has both a master and a slave interface. What happens to the address map in such a situation? What we end up with is that there is a microblaze zero and a microblaze one, which share all the peripherals, but the memory is something that is independent. In other words, you will notice that there is a microblaze one local memory and a microblaze zero local memory, which actually have overlapping memory locations. So the address location zero to one FFF, as seen by the two processors, even though these are different memory blocks, they are mapped to the same address. What this means is that each of the microblaze processors can of course run in parallel. They can access their data memory in parallel with the other one without having any conflict. But it also means that if I ask the question, what is stored at location 0100, the two processors are going to give me different answers because they have their own notion of what is location 0100. So in this way, we can see that the idea of a bus and having a separate arbiter allows us to connect arbitrarily complex systems. Of course, the more complicated we make it, we will eventually start running into problems because the there will be contention between the different devices that are trying to talk on the bus. And there will also be problems in terms of just the number of wires that we need to route around in different cases. But this definitely does allow us to scale in a much better fashion than trying to build point to point links and have custom instructions. So to summarize, we have standard techniques that are used in order to connect different peripherals together, which basically mean that we can design peripherals without knowing about what kind of processor we are using. And we can also design the processor without having to worry about what kind of peripherals we want to use. Multiple interconnection topologies are possible. The shared bus that we saw in most of these examples, of course, is the most common one. But we could also create point to point or point to multipoint kind of buses. Examples of the point to point buses in the example that we looked at earlier were the connections between the CPUs and their local memories. So effectively, we have a sort of mix of both. We have a shared bus as well as a point to point bus for a specific element that is present within the system. More complicated connections built on top of crossbar type of connections, different kinds of switching topologies and so on can also be considered for buses. But in general, performance starts to degrade as you try and make things more complicated. 
and an interesting evolution in the idea of buses in general is this concept of networks on chip. Networks on chip came about as a result of trying to address the problem of growing sizes. More and more processors, more and more peripherals mean larger and larger chips and integrating all of these at the same time becomes increasingly difficult. And not just that, even getting data from one place to another almost starts to become like routing data across the internet. And core ideas from there were in fact used in order to route packets of data rather than trying to solve the problem of routing wires on silicon. This is a very interesting set of topics all on its own, but is beyond the scope of what we will be doing in this set of lectures.